Hey there, welcome to Dirt Rich, seasonal conversations about food and farming. I'm Jared Lumen, the Soil Health Lead for the Sustainable Farming Association. Today we're talking about this thing called adaptive multi-paddock grazing, or AMP grazing for short. And with us to talk about this is SFA's grazing lead, Doug Voss. Doug, welcome to the Dirt Rich Podcast. Thanks, Jared. Uh, I'm looking forward to this conversation. As you know, it's it's something that I really care about. It's what my passion lies, what we do here at our farm, but I'm looking forward to hearing and, and learning a lot from you as well. And would you mind just starting off this conversation about grazing, talking about why we even do it and what are some of those benefits that come from grazing? Absolutely. Well, Jared, I also share the same passion you do with grazing, with grazing on our own farm. So one of the things that I had looked at when I first looked at grazing, you know, clo- more closely from what I was doing previously with my management was, uh, you know, the benefits, of course, with the environment, but also my financial benefits. Uh, you know, one thing to look at is how much energy farmers will expend to harvest, transport, and store feed, uh, especially during the growing season, and then spend as much energy, you know, to remove all the uh, fertility and put it back on the land. And so anytime we can eliminate some of these steps, you know, we're going to financially benefit uh, unless of course your passion to, to haul uh, product and nutrients back and forth. There's, you know, there's also associated losses with that process. But the other thing was ecologically, of course, when we're looking at natural systems, if we want to improve the ecology of our farms, we have to be able to model after nature. Um, we, we really can't beat nature's system. And so in natural systems, we've had large groups of cattle, uh, herbivores, you know, grazing and the effects that they have. And so the benefits ecologically are there's no substitute for, you know, what comes out of the back end of a cow or, or a small ruminant and those types of things. So anytime we can focus our efforts and our management around those perspectives, our farms are going to benefit. Yeah. Yeah. And I like how you talked about the financial side of it there at the beginning to uh, as a beginning farmer start of getting into it. And I'm, I'm fortunate to have grown up on a farm and have this farm infrastructure, a lot of it already established. But as I look to potentially get some land of my own and evaluate the different options of agricultural you know, enterprises to pursue, grazing really is appealing in a lot of ways. And those financial benefits are you know, a big part of it and that I'm not having to deal with the huge input costs of annual input expenses, seed costs, fertilizer, Uh, equipment, upfront equipment, capital expenses, and the risk that goes along with those large investments. And and there's also, you know, countless examples of farmers doing it without really any upfront investment using custom grazed cattle on leased land like Greg Judy's No Risk Ranching book. And so there's just a lot of benefits to that grazing system, I think, that are applicable to everybody, uh, you know, beginning or experienced, but are a little maybe especially appealing to a beginning farmer. Absolutely. You know, there's no um, code or, or such to, to say that you have to have something of a certain level to get into this. It really gets back to management again and understanding of natural systems and, you know, working with livestock. Of course, there's some skills that have to be developed, but a lot of times there's a lot more opportunity, I think, than people first anticipate, especially if we're looking at, you know, our traditional mindsets of farming or ranching in general. So uh, Greg Judy example is a great one of how to get into things and out of the box thinking that help can help a person get started in this area if they're interested. Yeah. I'm curious, you, you know, of some of those changes or some of those advantages of a beginning farmer, if, if you're not a beginning farmer, maybe you're an experienced farmer and you start to see some of those advantages, how would you recommend, or have you seen farmers make a transition to maybe a lower input, lower, lower investment type of grazing model to drop down and reduce some of those capital expenses? Oh, for sure. Um, so, you know, there's a number of ways to kind of address that issue. Uh, one of them is, you know, really understanding our context. So um, lay out the foundation of the scenario in which we're talking about, and that's going to change from every farm, and you know, from every farm to every farmer, and even from field to field, of course. So, um, you know, it's going to make a difference if you're coming from cropland or if you're coming from established perennial systems or, you um, you know, your location, all these types of things. But um, really, it comes down to a few infrastructure things, which I know you're going to want to talk about in a bit here. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, getting back and, and really studying how 
uh, you know, first settlers and, and as you know, we explore the records of European expansion into this continent, um, what people found and how to model what we're doing after that. Because when you're talking about inputs, you know, well, for example, you know, we, we don't do any off farm inputs on our farm here at Heaven for, for many years. And yet our production increases annually to the point that we're able to stock more animals on our farm each year, you know, from our management the year previous. So, you know, understanding basic soil function is very, very important uh, if you're if you're new to this. And so, you know, and, and you might be new as a, you know, beginning farmer, or you might be new to this because uh, you've been practicing the conventional, you know, farming model for the last, you know, 40 years, where, you know, we thought we had to balance things chemically. And, and such in order to grow the crops that we're looking to grow. So um, I can't understate the importance of understanding the basics of soil function in order to move forward. Once we get somewhat of an idea of that, we can certainly be looking at how we can cycle nutrients and carbon within our own operation and reap the benefits of that. So that's that's the first place I would certainly look. And there's just tremendous resources out there. There's just more coming through all the time on on the internet youtube videos you could occupy yourself for days and days on great information from from some really reputable sources of information along those lines yeah no it's it's the truth and i i find myself lost in a lot of those black holes of information uh via youtube or podcasts so it's a good and bad problem when you find yourself finding more work to do outside because you want to finish up the episode uh, of a podcast that you're listening to instead of getting inside and uh, taking some time off. But uh, there's advantages and disadvantages to all of that. Uh, I really liked how you talked about looking back at, at the historical records and what people saw when they first got here. I, I know I've been fascinated when I read some of the stories of people seeing herds of bison that you know would pass across them for you know hours or days at a time because the herds were so large. And that's what we're trying to mimic is those natural movements and those natural patterns of livestock on landscapes. And that kind of brings us into what this amp grazing or again, adaptive multi-paddock grazing is, is, is mimicking that natural movements of, of wildlife across landscapes. And if you wouldn't mind just sharing a little bit about what that looks like in practice on both your farm and in general, what that can look like on farms grazing in the Minnesota. Absolutely. I think the first thing to understand is the only constant in life is change. And a lot of times people like to really focus on the high stock density of, you know, natural herbivores um, before, you know, we kind of took place over here in North America. But the adaptive part is so key because we have to look at the fact that certain circumstances and conditions will provide opportunities for us to affect our resources differently depending on what we're seeing. Uh, a great example is uh, was last season for us. You know, we've been we've been grazing for a number of years here, but w- last year, May June, in the 2020 season, we had some pretty unusual conditions for what we're used to during that time period. You know, we were we were pretty dry here, and you know, the year previous on herds that we were moving that we that we probably utilized an acre to service uh, a herd of cattle for a day for, for vegetative requirements. You know, we were up to three and four acres uh, to do the same thing. And, and it wasn't so much that we didn't have maybe the forage there, but we were making sure that we were going to have forage when we needed to come around to that paddock the next time. And so really understanding and, and identifying that is so critical. So one of the things I always like to talk about when we're talking about adaptive is that, you know, it's a learning process and this is a journey, not a destination when we're learning how to really develop our management for our grazing, but good grazers don't not only just graze today for a day, they not only graze for a month or next month, or even next time they're coming back, but they're looking ahead a year in advance, a lot of times and where they would like to see themselves set up for when they get to that point in the future. And so, you know, that takes time to develop, obviously, but um, it's just important, I think, to understand that we can't narrow our focus too much on one specific aspect without considering all kinds of other things. And that's often referred to as holistic management. And that's a great resource. If, if you've never heard of holistic management, it's something to check out. Another reason to go out and do another job outside for a podcast, maybe, but there's, you know, you have to encompass everything and you're selling yourself short uh, as a manager, as a person. 
uh, that probably wear as many hats like a lot of us do. If you don't consider as many aspects of your life as you can, when you're looking at how you can manage your time and your resources, and especially due to grazing, because you know you can have the best laid plan, and then nature comes along and, and throws you a curveball or something unexpected. Uh, you know, last year we were a little bit caught off guard because we had prepared to graze places that we typically wouldn't be able to reach until July and August because of typical weather conditions come spring. But, um, you know, we were able to graze a lot of those places much earlier in the season. And so, you know, yeah, we had to switch things up a bit where we had a complete loss. No, um, we were able to adapt, but we covered a lot more acreage in a time period uh, to make sure we maintained good cover on the ground. You know, if we're opening things up and grazing too much, you know, we're going to cause ourselves uh, challenges later if we don't have the time in our plan to provide enough rest and recovery period for our paddocks uh, so that we are not reducing production over time or reducing the quality of the forages over time, which, um, you know, I guess we'll maybe take just a quick minute to identify what it means to be able to come back to a paddock, for example. Um, you know, the two things I look for is pointed leaves on the on the grasses that I've uh, grazed off previously, if they're pointed and if they have just a little bit of brown on the tips of those uh, blades of grass. That means to me that I've allowed enough recovery for that plant to, uh, to get to the point where it's safe to graze again without uh, hurting future production. So, um, you know, that's just kind of one of the things and that's going to vary on everybody's farm, on everybody's conditions throughout the year, throughout the seasons and whatnot, because you may have a really well-developed pasture where you can come back and graze it in 30 days and 40 days or something like that and have those conditions restored again, where you might have other areas of your farm in certain seasons that um, you have to allow much longer recovery periods because, uh, you know, we just don't have the soil health there or, or whatever the situation, but we have to be keen on identifying those things or we're going to set ourselves up for some challenges in the future. Yeah. And, and I think what you just talked about, there's a really interesting point that maybe is overlooked is that an acre it is maybe not equal to another acre uh, on the farm and our farm in particular, we, I can look across our farm and think of three, four five different, very different growing conditions in the plants. And if I just had a set plan, a set, you know, divide my farm into eight or 12 or whatever amount of paddocks and rotate through them on a consistent regular schedule. Uh, you know, I would see some plants that maybe, you know, was closer to the farm site and got manure hauled on them for generations and is much more productive. And some of the back farms on a hill that, you know, was eroded, you know, due to tillage 50 plus years ago and, and is not productive. And if I treat them the same, I'm going to see overgrazing on some and undergrazing on others. And, uh, and just not get that ultimate, the goal of what we're trying to do of giving adequate rest and recovery to everything. And, and so being able to look across your landscape and seeing what's different in different places is very important. In addition to what you talk about, not just recognizing the differences in your farm, but recognizing the differences in your farm from year to year and from season to season, you know, it's, you know, grazing in May, isn't the same as grazing in August and grazing in May of 2020 might not be the same as grazing in May of 2021. And so just that systems thinking of, you know, I'm going to divide it into X amount of paddocks and, and move X amount of days is just not uh, taking into consideration all of the factors that go into the plant and uh, soil and, and growth of, of our system. Yeah, that's just a, such a great point. You know, before we um, we started here with this podcast, we had mentioned that other word that I told you I was going to avoid. Right, rotational grazing is a lot of is a terminology that's often used in managed grazing systems, and I, I really hesitate to use that term just because a lot of people have thought that that was the the formulaic you know answer or, re, or recipe for uh, for really moving forward in their farm. And I'm not saying it couldn't be, but if it's not adaptive, um, there's just you know, it's there's just so many farms in our area and throughout the country that are rotationally overgrazed. So just because you have a couple extra pastures uh, to rotate between does not necessarily mean you're going to be the best manager yet going forward. So it, it really takes some thought and some planning and then responsive work with the management in order to be successful and to recognize. So, the you know, the skill of observation is just really paramount. And then having some conversations with some experienced grazers or technicians before you start a season is always beneficial. And so we, we've talked quite a bit there on adaptability uh, and the adaptive part of the adaptive multi-paddock grazing. What about the multi-paddock part? So how do we know how many paddocks we need? And 
when we should be moving from paddock to paddock and, and some of those questions that come along with that aspect of the grazing enterprise. Yep. So <clears throat> there's this classic response to a question like that and, and a lot of other ones in conversations concerning regenerative farming. I have a guess and of what that it might comes. be. <laughs> <laughs> and that it is, it depends. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> it, it certainly depends. Again, getting back to that context, you know, um, you and I know enough about how we each farm that, you know, if we talked about um, moving cattle daily or even multiple times a day, you know, is not much of a stretch because we've done that and we're used to doing that to a certain degree in season. Um, but, you know, you get in some circles and I've been in some of those conversations with people and, and people think, you know, you're absolutely off your rocker. If you think if, you know, if they think that you're going to move cattle daily, for example, uh, you know, there are a lot of situations in out West, especially where, you know, if they're moving every week, they think that's pretty frequent and I'm not criticizing that at all. It's just a different context, right? Mm -hmm. So it's really going to depend on your farm, what you have for resources, what your climate is like. Um, you know, they're on our farm. I can tell you, cause you know, we're in the heart of Minnesota here, right in central region. Um, if I don't move at least once daily, it's a rarity. Um, in fact, I think we've proven for ourselves on our own farm that, uh, we can't afford not to, uh, move at least daily. And there are times that we'll move, uh, three or even four times a day, depending on the situ situation. Um, but from that perspective, you know, we also have to understand how much we're giving them and we can actually stock, I feel more animals on our, on an acre of ground, uh, for the season with that approach. Now that's going to vary at throughout the season, but you know, moving cattle daily and then how many, when, what's our goal? You know, do we want to come back to this paddock in 30 days, 45 days, 60 days, um, you know, as a, a target, I would say, um, based on what we feel the conditions are going to be like, and then respond accordingly as, as time does pass and reveal, you know, what's actually going to happen with rainfall, with, with heat units, that type of thing. So, um, you know, I will say that we err on longer uh, recovery and rest periods than probably many farms because we are looking to try to get um, a little bit of a number of different aspects. One, we're trying to tap into latent seed banks. Now, latent seed banks are seeds that are laying dormant in your soil, uh, you know, just like forbs or weeds, some consider, but we have natives in these uh, soils of our paddocks and our fields and our cropland even too. Uh, we have not eradicated <laughs> all the native weed seeds and uh, grass seeds in our in our fields, even if they've been under uh, tillage for a number of years. There is still some in there and we can tap into those and let those express themselves when we create the right conditions. Uh, livestock are a tool in order to create some of those conditions. So we um, we do like to get out there longer. Now, typically it's kind of the industry considers 80 days or more a requirement to tap into latent seed banks. Uh, I have seen it in less, uh, whether it's consistent or not is another probably conversation. But um, uh, what I really, really like about seeing the expression of natural landscapes with the response to managed grazing is how that interacts with the animal's ability to balance their own rations, to adapt to their environments based on what they have available for feed. And so if that is a fascinating topic to you as it is to me, I would highly recommend Fred Provenza's work. Uh, he's got a great book, Nourish. Uh, is it Nourishment? Nourish? I forget. <laughs> <laughs> but um, the con it's, a, it's, a, it's a pretty comprehensive read. But um, I highly recommend looking at that, some of that stuff. Just fascinating, and it will make you a better grazer. And I would say it will help you look at nutrition for yourself, not only just the animals that you graze from a different perspective. Yeah. So I, I haven't read that book and I'll have to look it up, uh, find it under one of those names. Um, but when you, when you talk about the advantages of diversity, when it comes to the animal health, talk about the advantages of diversity when it comes to soil health and why that's so important to get that diversity in your pasture mix and your forage sward. Absolutely. Um, you know, it's like any of these topics, we could almost talk for days on each one. Yeah. So we'll talk about this one briefly, but you know, there's an interaction that we have between plants and each plant has got specific, uh, uh, you know, associations I'll say with different microbiology. And so when we start 
combining and integrating diversity in plant species, which can happen either by planting, but does not have to happen by planting. Just you know, like I mentioned, the tapping into the latent seed bank. Um, I love tapping into the latent seed bank because that gives nature the ability to express itself on your farm with the conditions that have been established there without us having to try to manipulate or force nature's hand into something that we think we need. And so um, Alan Williams has got some great work. He's got some great YouTube videos out on far on a farm in, you know, Southern U S and Mississippi area that he has simply turned animals on managed appropriately grazed nothing, but what people would think would be weeds, the livestock thrived, and he really did an excellent job recording what positive effects he had on that landscape. So it started out with weeds, folks. You know, it started out with with nature's ability to cover itself because nature never wants to be bare. And it moves in through the natural soil succession, which is a succession of microbiology as well. So, um, you know, there's a natural soil su selection succession from weeds all the way to old growth forests and pine pines, evergreens. So again, getting back to that, getting a basic understanding of soil function, um, we can't go wrong with too much diversity in our smorgasbord of, of our paddocks, right? Um, when we have that, we have the ability of different plant species to work together where we don't have linear math anymore. We have, um, it, we, it's logarithmic. So we start stacking upon, stacking upon different benefits. And we also contribute to a, an incredible resilience so when we do have events like we've had with flooding or drought, we can bounce back much faster and even sustain an appropriate uh, production throughout that time period with those challenges. You know, something nature just did all its own. You know, I have a um, a note here just to mention that, you know, we have to understand Ray Archuleta has been great about talking about how nature is self-organizing, self-regulating and self-healing. Uh, you know, we'd be foolish not to try to observe and and take advantage of that because, again, if we try to fight it, it will humble us. Uh, but if it doesn't humble us and we try to persist, it will it will take us down. So we have to understand we're not going to change natural system natural systems. We're going to have to figure out how we can work in conjunction with them, in harmony with them, in order to really provide a good quality of life and prosper in our efforts. Um, and, and a couple times in there, you mentioned the term weeds, which is uh, you know can be controversial. And, and you mentioned also how it can be eaten by livestock, and it's maybe you know weed in the traditional sense of the word as you know plant unwanted. But in reality, especially with this certain type of managed grazing and taking out the selectivity of the animal, the animal's ability to select and pick and choose their favorite plants uh, at a time, those weeds can actually be very good forages for the livestock. And we've actually seen that at our farm. Uh, we're an organic crop farm and have plenty of ragweed to go around. And, and oftentimes those are the first plants that our, our cattle will go to. Uh, but I also wanted to kind of shifting gears into the logistics of, of how this works. Earlier, you mentioned rest period of anywhere from 40 to 80 days. And also you talked about moving cattle one to two times a day. And so if you're talking about, you know, a rest period of 80 days, uh, you know, that's a lot of paddocks. <laughs> that's a lot of paddocks that you need. And so a lot of farmers, I'm sure, are just thinking, you know, I don't have the time, I don't have the money or the infrastructure to break my farm down into 80 separate paddocks or more. Uh, in reality, I mean, our farm, we've, you know, at certain times of the year and certain times we'll have over you know, hundreds of paddocks uh, when we start subdividing larger paddocks. So what are some of the infrastructure requirements and management requirements that go into breaking a farm up into those, you know, large numbers of paddocks required for this type of grazing and that type of length of rest period. Yep. Yep. No, that's a great fresh question. So how do we approach that? Right. Uh, I'll just tell you how we approach it. And now this is going to depend on your context again. So if you're out West and you're talking about hundreds of thousands of acres, you know, we're not talking about poly wire fence, select, you know, divisions. We're talking about herding groups and, and that's a different scenario altogether. So we're talking about our context here in central Minnesota and the way we approach it is this, and I'll tell you a little bit why we approach it as we go along. But uh, we start with a, a uh, in most situations, a good perimeter fence. You know, for us, that's that's uh, anywhere from three three or four high tensile wires. Now we're dealing with livestock, with uh, cattle, 
we're not dealing with sheep. So you have to build your perimeter fence to keep in your most challenging, you know, livestock. Uh, that would be different if we were talking sheep. Um, so that is where I start. And from there, I don't like to see any uh, interior fences that are permanent in general. Uh, I actually don't have any on my farm anymore. It offers way too many limitations, in my opinion. You can't be adaptive enough and you can't switch it up enough without um, a lot of work. And a lot of cases, there's a lot more maintenance involved if you're going to have a lot of internal fencing. So we use high tensile perimeter. And from that, we use uh, poly wire um, woven or, um, you know, that we can put out on a reel, temporary reels. We have a few different reels that we like to work with. And, and that's one of those things you can find out what works best for your scenario. But um, we do not ever approach grazing a same piece the same way all the time. And again, uh, we're not looking for a formula. We're not looking for a recipe for success. Anytime we get into a routine, we're going to provide ourselves a ceiling that we're going to either get to and not get past, or we'll actually degrade from that ceiling. So we will uh, lay in cattle differently. And again, your, your context will be different if you're a dairy farmer than if you're grazing stockers or beef cattle. Uh, you know, if you're looking at a dairy scenario, you're going to have to get those cattle back to the milking facility, you know, daily, a couple times a day. And so that's going to change a little bit how you approach this as well. You're going to have to do more lanes, but um, you know, there's a difference between long narrow paddocks and there is square paddocks or triangular paddocks and the cattle will graze differently when they're in a different shape paddock within your perimeter and um, starting out you know on one end of the farm but not starting out in the same place every year is critical because we're going to inhibit the expression of different diversity in our plants if we're always uh, grazing a plant off at the same time every year you know habitually so um Again, how do I approach it? Well, it's going to depend on your context, but um, you know, again, don't don't get into a routine. Look at your best situations to draw from, learn from that experience, and then adapt from that using as much of the information as you can gather at a time. So you're saying I don't have to break down my 80 acre field into one acre paddocks with water access at every single paddock. That's exactly what I'm saying, Jared. Awesome. <laughs> well, that simplifies things. <laughs> that does. Yep. And in fact, you brought up an interesting part too, you know, as far as water development, you know, there are a lot of different ways to approach that. And, um, and a lot of people think they, you know, going into it, they have an idea of what they need. I don't like to, uh, you know, encourage people to, if they're just starting out, especially with, which manage, with managed grazing, not to decide on a system of water from the very beginning, because your plan and your ideal situation will probably change over time. Um, we actually haul a fair amount of water on our farm because I like the flexibility of taking the water to the animals. It doesn't always work on every farm, right? And it depends on the size of your, your herd of, of cattle or, uh, you know, livestock. So, um, again, we're looking at all different aspects, but, um, I like to bring it to the animals. I don't really like a high traffic area in my, you know, my 80 acre field for the cattle to come back in the growing season, I guess I would look at having them come back to one place in the winter when things are frozen, because we're not going to have the same impact when, when we've got, uh, you know, nat nature's concrete out there. Yes. I do like to spread around the water areas and that can, you know, happen with temporary lines or, or, uh, riser pipes and, and different things like that. I, I do like your, the ultimate in flexibility because you have nothing permanent with the exception of your perimeter fence on our farm. We don't quite have that level of flexibility we have several large paddocks anywhere from you know three acres up to 40 acres but from there we subdivide further using the same infrastructure you talked about with poly wire we're subdividing anywhere down to one acre paddocks or or even smaller or, or larger depending on again the context what time of year what group of livestock do we have uh, what's our goal what's our lifestyle perhaps we've got a weekend with the family wedding and we want to we want to have a few days away, you know, the beauty of this adaptive system is that you have the flexibility to adjust for those factors that alter, you know, you can, you can give them a bigger paddock and, and once, in, once in a while do a three day rest period or a three day graze period so that we don't have that pressure on our lifestyle caused by the farm for certain, you know, family things. So that's the beauty of this adaptive system in my, my mind is that we have that flexibility to adjust to all factors, lifestyle related and uh, environment and, and time and 
season. You know, and one thing I want to point out, you know, if, if you do, if the farm does have some interior fencing, I mean, don't, it's not the end of the world for sure, but I do want people to understand that anytime you have internal fencing, you do change the ability of that soil to improve under those interior fences because you simply don't have the same impact. And I learned this from a, a YouTube video years ago uh, from Neil Dennis in Canada. Uh, he since passed away now, but uh, the guy really impressed me because he learned, he took a shovel out to his field and he dug up a spade full of ground where his cattle grazed and he dug, dug up a spade full under one of his interior uh, fences and he found a drastic difference in that soil's carbon content based on just a visual inspection. And at that point, you know, he ripped out all his internal fences and I thought just that was just incredible. I mean, not only that, but just think of the maintenance that goes into some of those internal fences. I mean, um, you know, birds, you know, they'll love to, if there's thistles anywhere in the countryside, you know, they'll love to eat those thistle seeds and like to sit on your fence and, and leave them behind. And a lot of farms have a lot of thistle under their fence rows, especially if they're overgrazing and there's exposed dirt. And, um, you know, you don't have to trim all those lines or maintain those lines if they're not there. You can let the cattle trample that stuff if there is something there that you don't want to see. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. Also, it's something we don't have on our farm. We're fortunate that we have water wells and water lines infrastructure set up all over the place, but not everybody has that. And some folks have natural water systems that they get to work with or work around, depending on, I guess, your view of it. I don't have that. I'm curious, I, do you have natural water sources on your farm that you use for watering your livestock? And how do you manage that in a way that doesn't do any sort of destruction to the the actual you know, infrastructure, the pond, the, the lake, the stream, and also doesn't result in nutrient runoff or, or anything in that water source as well. No, oh, that's a great, great point. So we, uh, we do have natural water uh, sources in places. Uh, we have some drainage ditches. We have, uh, we have a river through our home faster and, and we do allow restricted access to areas of that during the growing season. Uh, again, um, negative aspects or impacts of livestock are associated with time and not numbers. So whether it's a uh, riparian area or uh, a hillside uh, or whatever the case might be, you know, appropriate limitations on livestock and where they can be for how long is really the key when we're looking at how we're going to affect the resource. We actually have really stable banks on our, our river. Um, it's we we uh, will we'll fence off a smaller area where the cattle can access water. They're not necessarily standing in it, you know. Um, except for maybe the front legs in a lot of scenarios, but um, there are other times that we'll give them much bigger areas depending on how much. So, you know, even the water requirements, if you're using the natural water as a source of water for the cattle to drink, uh, it's going to change throughout the season. So um, in the early spring, when grass is really lush, you know, we're, we're going to consume a lot less water when, especially when temperatures are lower than when we get later in the growing season, um, and, you know, heat and humidity are an issue and that type of thing. So all things considered, we we uh, we do allow access, but limited. And we monitor the effects of that over time as well. You know, if I gave my cattle free reign in the growing season, yeah, they would have sandy spots where they walk up uh, areas in their pasture they walk through. And, and uh, those would be impacted to the point where, yes, we would probably have runoff issues and and such and the cattle would uh, uh i guess another example i like to show is that when we're not moving cattle regularly uh they will ball up especially when you have fly pressures and that type of thing and you know they'll just ball up and they'll be <laughs> impact in one area pretty in intensely that will take quite a while to recover if we don't manage for it and keep the animals off that area for a while where if we move animals daily or multiple times during the day in those conditions we have a much different effect on the landscape with our animals. But um, yes, we, and I'll, I'll throw this out there too, is that uh, there was one year in our river bottom land that we did not have livestock on. And uh, as a kid, I loved to fish in that river. And that year <laughs> I, I couldn't catch a fish to save my life. But every other year when we've had livestock integrated on our river bottom land, we've been able to catch fish throughout the uh, summer months. So uh, again, how are we fitting into nature's master plan, you know, that was set forth before we started having the impact on our environment that we do today? Um, so yes, we can actually repair riparian areas with livestock 
if we can you know approach it appropriately so having talked a little bit about the logistics of making this system work you've been doing this for quite a while now what are some of the benefits you've seen on your land and your soils for your livestock and to your pocketbook as much as you want to share some of the the financial benefits that you've seen through this absolutely um one thing i'll just say that i have a peace of mind that i've never had in years previous um so just a little bit more background you know traditionally we've been a dairy farm commercial dairy farm years for years uh and then that went into organic crop production for a number of years as well and um but what was what what we're doing with livestock now it far exceeds anything i feel we did before with how we're able to work with the systems that we have to work with and how we're able to stack upon the benefits and the advances we made last year this next year and financially we have a consistent uh way more predictable cash flow scenario than we did years previous especially with organic crop production we had good profit potential uh but we didn't have the consistency that i like to see i mean we'd have years that we would still have uh because again we're we're developed we're depending at that time on on tillage for weed control and that type of thing where you know i i i almost love just about everything that grows in our pastures because if the cattle aren't eating it we're putting it down and we're building soil fertility with it just with high stock or dense stock densities of livestock in those areas i'm not concerned about an outbreak of a noxious weed um I don't like to even use the word invasive species because invasive species says one thing to so many people. And in my opinion, the only invasive species is humans. <laughs> uh, we There's not a plant on my farm that I'm I'm afraid that's going to get out of control because I have good tools and I've learned how to use those tools uh, well enough where I have confidence in how I approach each season. So, you know, uh, the, again, the peace of mind. Yeah, we have a lot of work during the growing season and that type of thing, but I have l- far fewer um, you know, challenges where I'm not going to be productive or profitable on an acre of ground than I have ever had before. Are there any last thoughts you want to share on grazing specifically, things that you see, things that are important, things to consider when establishing or kind of embarking down this journey of a, building a grazing system? Absolutely. And I'll, I'll just add this is that I don't, I don't see another way to restore or rebuild or improve our resources outside of grazing and i mean manage well managed grazing adaptable grazing and so whether you're listening to this podcast from a grazing perspective or even a land owner perspective uh you know you don't have to own cattle uh you don't have to be an experienced grazer you don't have to be even of the age that you can do the work yourself but i would all i would just like to encourage people to look at and explore ways that you can get livestock appropriately applied to your land if you'd like to see it move forward um you know we can we have a tendency to think that we can buy our way out of our challenge situations uh you know in farming a lot of times people are looking for what product do i apply to improve my farm and you know like i said before there's no substitute for what comes out the back end of a cow and i really kind of mean that and it's not just what comes out the back but we're you know we're dealing with biological systems that are dealing with living breathing plants. And anytime we can encourage life on our farms, we're going to benefit. So with that, you know, I encourage you to look at ways to in- integrate livestock and start small. If that's if that's uh, the way you need to approach it, we always look at uh, incorporating changes in our operations with however, you know, whatever it takes where we can still sleep well at night. Um, but yes, um, I, I feel that well-managed livestock scenarios with a grazing, adaptive grazing is just a great way to improve everything from you know the air we breathe to the water we drink and even the food that we eat well thank you for being so willing and open to share all of your experiences and one thing that i would just want to mention to all of our listeners is that if this is something you want to do if this is something you're interested in something sounded good about what we were just talking about then you don't have to do this alone there's a lot of resources and opportunities to get involved and network out there that will help you help you with this. And actually the SFA Sustainable Farming Association, we have funding available to help farmers with this program. We are working right now with the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation to offer technical assistance to grazers, specifically in the prairie pothole region of Western 
Minnesota. And so if you're in that region, or even if you're outside of that region, reach out. Uh, I'm your soil health lead with SFA and Doug is our grazing lead. We've got uh, people willing and, and able to help you on this. You don't have to do it alone because there are some challenges and some complications, but we both believe that the rewards are well worth the investment and the efforts. So uh, it, I don't know if Doug, if you have anything to add on that, no, you pretty much got it, Jared. Reach out. We'd be happy to have a conversation. Awesome. Yeah. And you can find more information about that and just everything. We've got resources, uh, resource manuals available on our website, sfa-mn.org. We've got more podcasts than this out. We've got YouTube channels. Uh, really just uh, soak it up. We've got lots of information available to you. So thanks, Doug. Thanks so much for joining me today and sharing. And, and I look forward to talking to you again soon. Sounds good, Jared. Have a great one. Dirt Rich is produced by the Sustainable Farming Association. We believe that agriculture, done well, heals. For more resources or to tap into the Farmer to Farmer Network, visit us at sfa-mn.org.